I, you know, one of the things I've learned, for example, I teach my students in my second year personality class about what happened in the Soviet Union, in, in the Gulag Archipelago. And I use Solzhenitsyn as an exemplar, Alexander Solzhenitsyn as an exemplar of existential psychology, because I think he's actually the wisest of the existential psychologists, even though he was primarily a historian and a literary figure. Mm -hmm. Well, most of the students don't even know what happened in the Soviet Union. Well, why is that exactly? And the reason for that is that radical leftist ideologue uh, intellectuals in the West have never properly apologized for the role for the role they played in the in the absolute murderousness of the of the 20th century. And so students don't even know about it. So they can come out to McMaster behind their their damnable poster with a hammer and sickle on it and act like they're virtuous. Mm -hmm. Do you it's, think it's that? Appalling. Do you think that trend was only sort of significant to that specific McMaster incident, or do you see? this type of ideology influencing campus protests beyond McMaster in general? Well, I think, the, I think that, that part of it's, it's everywhere. It's, it's not just in campus protests. Mm -hmm. I mean, the, the campuses are, are, are overrun in large part with disciplines that have, in my estimation, no valid reason to exist. Mm -hmm. I think disciplines like women's studies should be defunded. Mm -hmm. Any of the activist disciplines who, mm -hmm. who act who, whose primarily, primary role is the overthrow of, 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 for example, of the patriarchy, which is about as ill-defined a concept as you could possibly formulate, mm -hmm. that it's enough, that we've, we've done enough public funding of that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. We're providing, we're providing full-time destructive employment for people who are doing nothing but causing trouble, and so seriously say, nothing. You would say that because you think that these departments are causing harm or could have the potential to cause harm, that university administration should defund them, right? No, I don't or, think they should okay. defund them. Who the hell cares what I think about them? Mm -hmm. That isn't why I think that they should be defunded at all. Okay. I think they should be defunded because what they promote has zero intellectual credibility. Their research methods don't qualify as research methods. Mm -hmm. Their publications, 80% of humanities publications now, garner zero citations. That's not very many citations. Mm -hmm. And it's... <laughs> So, and the little trick, as far as I can tell, is what happens is that people write something that no one will read. They know perfectly well that no one will read it. They circulate it around their, their tiny group of compatriots who occupy the same little, little, what, a little area on the intellectual spectrum. So then it's peer reviewed, then it's published by major journals who sell it at inflated prices to libraries who squirreled away to, and, and only increase the noise to signal ratio in relationship to the sum total of human knowledge. Mm -hmm. It's a scam from top to bottom. So, and you know, what, one of the, what well, here's an example. Mm -hmm. Well, let me give you an example. Sure. So, it, here's one of the things that really bothered me about what was going on in Ontario, and this is happening everywhere. And, and I, ma I made this claim when I made my first video, since we have to get into this. So, the, the technical claim in, in the Ontario legisla legislation now, and this, is ha this has already happened in New York, by the way. This is not only a Canadian thing. It's happening in Australia. It's happening in New Zealand. It's happening everywhere. Here's the claim. There's biological sex. There's gender identity there's gender expression, and there's sexual proclivity, and they vary independently. That's the technical claim. It's built into the Canadian law. That's not true. Not a, not a bit of that is true. The correlation between biological sex and gender identity exceeds 0.99. It's virtually perfect. It's the very definition of non-independent. So you think almost everyone who's biologically male identifies as biologically male. Almost everyone who identifies as biologically male dresses and acts male. That's the gender identity element. And almost everybody who is biologically male, who identifies as male, who dresses as male, is in fact heterosexual. Those things are incredibly tightly linked. But the technical claim in the legislation is that they vary independently. Wrong. Now, I got in trouble well, for saying that because what mm -hmm. people claimed was that I was denying the existence of people who don't fit neatly into the gendered categories, what about which I wasn't the, um, doing at all. Point zero one or whatever the percentage may be that wouldn't fall neatly under that correlation. So, certainly, if there were a perfect correlation, that would work. But if there's not, it would seem, perhaps, that you're excluding certain people, right? So, if, if most people tend to identify a certain way, but there is that point zero one that's not, I'm not, I was never denying their existence. Okay. I was denying the validity of the claim that those four levels of analysis existed independently of one another, which they don't. It's a false claim. And the reason that the, 
the radical social constructionists who are pursuing this line of reasoning, which is completely discredited as far as I'm mm -hmm. concerned. I don't think it's any better than claiming that the world is flat. Mm -hmm. The reason that they're pursuing it legally is because they know perfectly well that they've lost the scientific discussion. I mean, I debated someone on Canadian public television who had the gall to say that the, you know, the scientific consensus over the last four decades was that there was no biological difference between men and women. I mean, and that was I could, well, one of the things that was so absolutely absurd about that. There were many things that were absurd about it, was that I was in trouble with the university at that point, and he wasn't. It's like, first of all, that is that is not the scientific consensus of the last four decades. And, and the idea that there are no biological differences between men and women, it's the sort of thing you hear that, it just makes your jaw drop. Now, what, what you could say is that if you took all the dimensions along which men and women vary, and, and there's a substantial number of them, that there's substantial overlap between men and women on almost all of the dimensions. Now, that's not really true with chromosomal identity, although there are some exceptions. Like with personality, for example, and I happen to be somewhat of an expert on personality, there are marked differences between men and women, but the overlap exceeds the differences. So, for example, women are higher in agreeableness. And you might say, well, that's socio-culturally constructed, but it turns out that it isn't. Because if you look across cultures, and you, you look at the cultures that have moved most forward with, um, with gender equality provisions at the social and political le levels, and that would be the Scandinavian countries, the, the differences in personality between women, men and women maximize in those countries. These aren't tiny studies. These are studies that involve tens of thousands of people and that have been well replicated by a series of independent researchers. And so, with per, with per, if you add the personality differences between men and women across all the personality traits, you can almost perfectly segregate men from women. And that has not, that, that doesn't take into account the obvious things like arm angle and hip width, hip, hip width compared to, to waist width, and shoulder width, and upper body strength, and height, and weight, and the biochemical differences. And, I mean, it's, it's so preposterous that it's, be, it's, it's beyond conception to me that we're actually even discussing it. But I was making a specific claim, which is the law says these four levels of analysis vary independently. The only reason they're associated with one another is for cultural reasons. No, mm -hmm. wrong. And you don't get to put fallacious scientific truths into the law. Mm -hmm. not or if you're going to do that, then I'm not going to abide by that particular law. I'm going to object to it, which is exactly what I should be doing. So do you think that a necessary premise for us to accept to have a law like that, a law that extends protections to these groups, is that these identities are independent from each other, fully independent? No. Or could we accept, like, if they had just justified it as, we know that these aren't fully independent, but we think there are other good reasons to provide these protections, would you be, would your stance on the law change? Well, the law as it's currently formulated doesn't, in fact, it undermines the protection that these sorts of groups have been pursuing and seeking for years. So let's say, let's take the, mm -hmm. let's, let's accept the proposition that these vary independently or, or that they're only socio-culturally constructed. Mm -hmm. Okay, so where does that leave your discussion of homosexuality? So if the, if the fundamentalist Christians say, well, if, if homosexuality is nothing but a socio-cultural construct, then why do we have to put up with it? It's a perfectly valid argument. They say, well, no, you know, people, people are born into their sexual proclivity. Now, I'm not saying that they are or not, because I, I'm not making either of those choices. Sure. What I am pointing out is that the legislation and policies of that sort, as currently formulated, actually undermine the very arguments that many of the activist groups have been using to promote the fact that they, they are that they're deserving, let's say, that they're deserving of their, of their non-standard identity, that the non-standard identity is justifiable. If your sexual proclivity is nothing but a whim, then why should I put up with it? No, I, it's perfectly reasonable for me to say, no, well, we'll just reshape it because you're, inf you're infinitely malleable. Now, you know, it, it isn't exactly, we don't exactly know the degree to which such things as, let's say, sexual identity and sexual proclivity are biologically predicated or socioculturally instantiated. Mm -hmm. But when you, when you put forward legislation that insists on one to the exclusion of the other, you better be careful because you're going to be hooked, hooked in your own noose. And so when I read through the legislation and the policies that surrounded it, I thought, this isn't going to protect the people that it's supposed to protect. But it doesn't matter because the legislation was never designed to protect people. It was designed to advance a certain kind of political agenda, mm -hmm. which is partly why I'm object objecting to it. Mm -hmm. So and I'm not, 
willing in the slightest to presume that just because activist groups with this postmodern neo-Marxist ethic stand up and say, well, we're on the side of the oppressed, that that makes them A, on the side of the oppressed, or B, virtuous. I don't buy either of those arguments. I don't think they stand for what they say they stand for. I don't think they're promoting a doctrine that's going to do what they claim it will do. I don't believe that they're good and the rest of the world bad. I don't buy their oppressor-victim dichotomy. I don't admire their philosophical position. I think they don't know anything about history, or if they do know anything about history, then they're malevolent for pursuing exactly the same policies that led us into terrible situations before. So, In what ways do you think the policies that are being advocated, maybe you could talk a bit about the particular harms you think that this Canadian bill would have. Even if we don't accept the theoretical or political or historical rationale for the bill, could it be that it still produces good consequences? Or do you think that there's even a consequentialist argument against this sort of bill? And if so, what do you think the Well, the letters that I've received from the transsexual people I described mm -hmm. indicate instantly that it's not producing positive, positive effects at all. 